Uh, I discern patterns in nature that cause me to believe that science, which I recently praised, uh, has overlooked in very important aspects of reality that you don't need an atom smasher or a DNA sequencer or a probe to Ganymede to uh, register. And what do I mean by that? Science has overlooked two aspects of nature that as you sit here, I believe you can hear my case and that you will find in my favor. Here, here is what it is. The first thing which science has not taken on board is the fact that as you get nearer and nearer the moment in time that we call the present, things become more and more complicated. Now that may seem like a trivial statement, but there's no reason for the universe to work like that. Why does the universe go from simple to complicated? Why do you get, at first, moments after the Big Bang, a, an ocean of free electrons uh, at such a state of temperature and energy that no molecular bonds can form? Atomic systems can't even form because the, the bond strength is overwhelmed by the thermal energy in the system. Then it cools down and atoms condense a more complicated thing than electrons by orders of magnitude. Further cooling, further nuclear cooking of the most primitive elements, hydrogen and helium, in gravitationally aggregated masses called stars, cooks out the heavier elements. They emerge. They were never seen before until fusion began to occur in these hydrogen masses. And, they, and these fusion processes cook out iron, sulfur, carbon, bingo, carbon, molecules. Now, an order of magnitude in their complexity greater than atoms, as atoms are compared to electrons. And then, you know, and I'm compressing 13 billion years of emergence here into 30 seconds, then uh, out of the molecular soup you get long chain polymers, out of the long chain polymers you get molecular tr transcription systems, i.e. prebiotic stuff, out of that you get non-nucleated DNA, out of that nucleated DNA, out of that membranes, organelles, organisms, higher organisms, differentiation of tissue, our dear selves, culture, language, technology, and the eschaton. Now, why this is so obvious, I mean leaving out the eschaton if you like, but all the rest of it is, self, is totally self-apparent. Why doesn't science take that on board as a major problem in the description of nature, the emergence of complexity? Well, you ask a scientist, they say, well, you see, uh, these are separate domains of nature. How atoms become molecules has nothing to do with how animals become human beings. This is bullshit. This is just some kind of compartmentalized thinking where you don't want to come to grips with the overarching metaphors that are working on various levels. The advent of the understanding of the fractal ordering of nature now makes it clear that voting patterns in Orange County, distribution of anemones on the Great Barrier Reef, and the cratering of Europa all follow the same power laws. So, that's the first thing which science has staring in, its, in the face and has never taken on board. Now, I said there were two things. The second thing is related to the first. A double shot of espresso, you're really getting your money's worth here. <laughs> Uh, the second thing which science has taken on board 
uh, has refused to take on board is that this process of complexification that I just described to you, as you approach the place in time called the present, happens faster and faster. That was not necessarily implied by the first observation. The first observation was simply that there was a process which was moving from simple to complex. Now we add the concept of a process which is ever accelerating as it moves from the simple to the complex. So uh, more and more happens as you approach the present. And since these processes have been running since the Big Bang, there is no argument to be entertained that they will reverse themselves suddenly. No, they're not going to reverse themselves after 13 billion years. Duh. <laughs> so, uh, so then, but the implication of that carried to its ultimate extreme leads to a conclusion most people find too wild to entertain. If the universe is evolving deeper and deeper into complexity, faster and faster, and if now in a human lifetime we can see a small portion of this curve, it no longer appears flat to us because of our nearness in relation, you understand what I'm saying? And that we can actually discern the curve. And so that means, I believe, that by extrapolating this process, we should then logically conclude that we are very near, relative to the life of the universe, we are very near to the place where this ramping up of complexity will become so excruciatingly rapid that more change will happen in a single week than happened in the previous 13 billion years. And that then there will come a moment where more will happen in a single minute than happened in the previous 13 billion. And then a moment will come when more will happen in, in 6.55 times 10 to the uh, 23rd uh, erg seconds. More will happen than has happened. And people say, well, but that's crazy. I mean, how, what kind of universe is that? That ramp, that... <laughs> well, wait a minute. What's so crazy about this? Let's look at what the competition is peddling. <laughs> what the competition would have you believe is that the universe sprang from nothing in a single moment for no reason. Well, now, whatever you think about that theory, in the interest of being awake, please notice that that is the limit case for credulity. Do you know what I mean by that? I mean that if you can believe that, you can believe anything. That is the most improbable proposition the human mind can conceive of. I challenge you to top it. You know, I mean, I know the Scientologists think God is a clam on another planet, but I don't think that tops this idea. <laughs> that the universe sprang from nothing in a single moment for no reason. That is the art, that's article of faith number one. I say, no, no, this, this, if we're talking about universes that spring from nothing, if we're, if we're going to talk like that, then surely such universes occur in a situation of great complexity. In other words, if we're going to look for an enormous eruption of emergent phenomena, an enormous, sudden, unexpected download of novelty, we shouldn't look in a domain of zero space, zero time, zero energy, zero anti-entropic organization. That's the worst place to look. That's the least likely place where such a singularity would, be, would spring out. Where should you look if you believe in this jabberwock, this chimera, this particular beast? Where should you hunt this snark? 
You should hunt it in domains of immense complexity where you have matter, energy, light, chemistry, language, machines, people, cultures, intentionality, minds, minds, minds. And if you throw all that stuff together and shake it up, it's maybe not a sure thing that you will get a singularity, but you're certainly betting right. You're now you figured it out. So I, I think that uh, science is, is extremely hostile to the idea that the universe is complexifying and complexifying more and more rapidly. Why? It's just a matter, it's just a historical issue. It has to do with the fact that 19th century English biology was extremely hostile to what it called deism. Deism was the reigning religious paradigm of the 19th century, and it's the idea that God is a clockmaker, and that God made the universe and wound it up like a clock and went away. And it, what <coughs> irked those, what irked Darwin and Lyle and those people was the idea that the universe has a purpose. You see, they thought that if it has a purpose, this somehow means there is a God, and they weren't up for that. Uh, they were trying to build rational science into a tool for understanding nature. I think we have grown beyond that, and that's a, it's foolish to wear those tight 19th century high-button shoes. We can believe that the universe is following an organizational vector. We can believe that the universe is under the influence of a strange attractor. We can believe that the universe is pulled toward a future uh, denouement, as well as pushed by the unfolding of causal necessity. We can believe all of that without evoking the 19th century concept of God. Now, why do I spend so much time on this? And, you know, what, what's so great about all this? Here's what's so great about all this. If you, if you will join me in this belief that the universe works as I have described, it's an engine for the generation of complexity, and it preserves complexity, <clears throat> and it builds on complexity to ever higher levels. If you entertain this, guess what happens? It's like a light comes on on the human condition. Who are we in my story? Well, first let me tell you who are we in science's story. We are nobody. We are lucky to be here. We are a cosmic accident. We exist on an ordinary star. <coughs> at the edge of, an, of a typical galaxy in an ordinary part of space and time. And essentially, our existence is without meaning, or you have to perform one of those existential pate dues where you confer meaning, or you know, one of these postmodern you know, soft shoes. <laughs> but if I'm right, that the universe has an appetite for novelty, then we are the apple of its eye. Suddenly, cosmic purpose is restored to us. We left the center of the cosmic stage in the 13th century and haven't been back since. But this idea says, no, people matter. You are the cutting edge of a 13 billion year old process of defining novelty. Your acts matter. Your thoughts matter. Your, your purpose, to add to the complexity. Your enemy, disorder, entropy, stupidity, and tastelessness. Uh, and, and so suddenly then, you know, you have a morality, you have an ethical arrow, you have contextualization in the processes of nature, you have meaning, you have authenticity, you have hope, you have the cancellation of existentialism and positivism and all that late 20th century crapola that people used to uh, entertain back in the old days. So uh, that's why I uh, I'm so keen for the idea of novelty because it seems self-evident. Uh, 
And, you know, we can argue about whether the eschaton will arrive uh, in 2000 or 2012 or 3000. But I cannot believe that there is anybody in this room tonight who can, that the hardest thing to imagine is human history going on for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of more years. That's impossible. We, have, we see around us the processes that make of history a self-limited game. The clock's ticking, folks. You think we can do gene splicing and internet and psychedelic <coughs> drugs and manipulation of our genetic material and star flight and atom uh, uh, antimatter and uh, uh, quantum teleportation and all these things? You can extrapolate that 500 years into the future? Don't be ridiculous. No, history is some kind of a phase transition. It only lasts about 25,000 years. Some people think that's a long time. Some people think it's a short time. It depends on where you stand. I think of it as snap. You know, one moment you're hunting uh, ungulates on the plains of Africa, and the next moment you're hurling a gold deterbium super conducting extra stellar device toward Alpha Centauri with all of mankind aboard in virtual space being run as a simulation in circuitry. <laughs> you know? It's just first the one thing, then the other thing. Uh, but now history, which lasts 25,000 years, is this weird period where you're neither fish nor fowl. You know, you're not the hunting ape anymore, but you are not yet the 16-dimensional digital god, you know? And, and in that transition phase, there is confusion, there is uh, angst. But now we're at the end. We have no, I, I maintain anybody who's peddling angst and peddling pessimism and peddling all this stuff is just that's so two minutes ago. <laughs> Question.